This is the seminar on biblical interpretation and it's a privilege to have you here with us as we acquire new concepts and tools to enhance our understanding of the scriptures. This series of lectures is brought to you by the Biblical Research Institute and joining us now is Dr. Frank Hazel, Associate Director of the BRI, who is also going to introduce us to the next theme. Welcome Dr. Hazel. What shall we learn today? Today we learn something really interesting, and not just if you're interested in history, but especially if you're interested in history. It's the relationship between scripture, history, and biblical interpretation. Many people uh, claim and believe that the Bible is uh, a book that is full of historical mistakes and inaccuracies, and the Bible cannot really be trusted in matters of history and the Bible doesn't present us with a, a real uh, historical, reliable account of what things actually took place and how they took place uh, over time. And uh, many people have challenged that and uh, have debunked the Bible really because they believe that the Bible is just a document of faith that teaches us about theology but has nothing to do with historical reality. The critics of the Bible usually start their criticism with historical details, and then it moves on from there. And, and so we see why that is so important for our understanding of the Bible and the biblical hermeneutics. And who is presenting this subject? An expert in the field, Dr. Michael Hazel. Dr. Hazel is a professor of Old Testament and Biblical Archaeology at the major university, the Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. He is really an expert archaeologist, has uh, done several archaeological digs in Israel, in uh, Lachish, in Kibbet Kayafa, and uh, many other places. If you are interested, if I have whetted your appetite, give it a try, listen to the video, and then read the, the chapter in the book that will have many additional uh, information for you. And may God bless you as you learn uh, something interesting and new. We are back with the seminar on Biblical Interpretation and Dr. Michael Hazel joins us now to discuss the elements of Biblical hermeneutics and how we can see the harmony between these elements and Scripture's self-claims. Dr. Hazel, thank you for being with us. And let's begin with the question, why does history matter for someone who believes in the Bible? One of the things that makes the Bible unique when compared to any other uh, religious text of any major world religion is the fact that the Bible is constituted in history. What we mean by that is that the Bible really, um, from its very first beginnings, displays a God and presents a God that is actively involved in history, actively involved in our history as well. The very first uh, verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, clearly indicates that God is actively involved from the beginning and that he continues to shape and continues to work through uh, humanity to achieve his purposes. So after the fall, he seeks out Adam and Eve in the garden. He is uh, personally involved in, in presenting a plan of salvation. He works through history as he sends prophets and as he works in providing uh, that plan of salvation and making sure that plan of salvation works out according to his timing. And it's very interesting that, that in that interaction with history, God also is involved in our own uh, personal lives as well. So when we talk about history, it's not something abstract. Uh, it's something that we all live our lives in and through because we are we are living in time and we're living in space. And as we move through time and space, our lives are, are inconceivable without history. Every day, every moment, we are creating history. And so uh, our existence in that, in that fashion is, is very much connected to this concept. The idea of a personal God who is working in history is unique to the Judeo-Christian faith and to the biblical faith. 
And really, it is only the monotheistic religions of the world, which are really based on uh, the Bible, that we have this concept that history matters and that history is significant. So as we look at scripture and as we look at the elements of scripture, we can see that from the beginning all the way to the very end of the last book of, uh, of the Bible and the last chapter of the book of Revelation, God is promising his people that he will be involved in their lives. So that is a stark contrast then to the modernist and postmodernist worldviews in many ways, because as modernism arose, it was a um, it arose on different presuppositions, different principles, different assumptions, we could say, and those assumptions really uh, negated the biblical view that God is active in history or that God is even that He's working in in our lives. Um, the first principle of modernism. Uh, of what is called the historical critical method is the principle of correlation, which is based on philosophical naturalism, which simply is a cause and effect kind of look at, at the world around us and at natural laws. It doesn't go beyond those natural laws to ask how those natural laws came into being, but it simply focuses on the natural laws. And so uh, most scientists and most uh, philosophers and thinkers who are, who are naturalistic um, philosophers, they, they would say that, that there, it is impossible for a divine intervention in history. It just doesn't happen. We're just living on a, on a cause and effect cycle, a closed continuum, if you will, that cannot be penetrated from the supernatural outside. So that's the first presupposition. The second presupposition speaks of uh, that uh, the principle of analogy, which basically says that you have a current event that you are, are seeing today, and you interpret the past based on what you see today. So one-time events are very difficult to a, a, account for. We have one-time events in the Bible, like creation. We have one-time events in the Bible, like um, the plagues that took place in Egypt. We have one-time events in the Bible, like the worldwide flood. Well, we don't see those kinds of things happening today directly by God, maybe. And so the idea that those things happen in the past is also relegated by the modernist thinker to something that is that is relegated to the past. And that excludes, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of things. And it also does not allow for one time events in history in many ways. So the past is interpreted on the basis of the present and on the basis of, of this uh, continuity, this, this, this homogeneity, this, this sameness of everything. And it really doesn't, again, allow God to do something new and allow God to do something different. The last principle, which is probably the most crucial principle in all of this, is the principle of methodological doubt or criticism. And it looks at the Bible through the lens of skepticism. It looks at the Bible with the assumption that the Bible is already not a historical document based on the first two principles, and that the only way we can take it as historical is to uh, somehow uh, find validation for that historicity or for that event outside of the Bible. So the Bible is guilty until proven innocent. And where I live in my part of the world, uh, the ju judicial system works in a very different manner. In my part of the world, the judicial system works on a person being innocent until proven guilty in the realm of the courts. So, so we take a very different view towards the Bible uh, when we take that approach. And we basically are saying, well, un unless we find it in the world around us uh, through science, through uh, archaeology, through some other means, uh, that event didn't take place. So the Bible really is placed in a, in a category um, that many other pieces of literature are not placed. I would say many other ancient pieces of literature are not placed. And we provide these principles for the Bible when we really don't provide these principles in other places. Let me give you an example. The ancient Egyptians, they had texts, of course, and they had annals, and they had uh, historical records. We don't 
approach those records with the same same methodological doubt we approached the Bible with, um, even though they had also a theistic worldview, a polytheistic worldview. Um, we we don't question whether Tutmosa the Third campaigned into Canaan seventeen times. Uh, we take pretty much what he wrote um, as what it as as history. Uh, so we kind of have a double standard sometimes when it comes to the Bible, which is very interesting. But at the same time, the Bible is based on different presuppositions than the ones we just described. So modernism really play, play, places new presuppositions on the Bible that really are not there in the Bible itself. And we're superimposing those onto scripture. We call this kind of uh, eisegesis. We, we superimpose those onto scripture and then we really negate what scripture actually is providing us as evidence for God's work and intervention in history. So just in brief, let me just summarize that, what I mean by that. In the principle of correlation, if God doesn't intervene in history, well, then there are no miracles uh, because God cannot perform those miracles. There, are, there is no deliverance by God of the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, that was more of a natural event. And, you know, we don't see countries and civilizations established that way today. And so it's very unlikely, based on the principle of analogy, that that happened that way in the past. And uh, we, we have a hard time. We have not found direct evidence for the Exodus event in Egyptian records, uh, and so we doubt whether that event took place because we haven't found evidence outside the Bible for it. And so this uh, places that event in history, which was a very crucial event in the Bible and is referenced over and over again uh, after the books of Moses were written uh, throughout Scripture until the book of Revelation. Over and over again, we have those uh, references to the Exodus. In fact, the Exodus is quoted, I think, second or third compared to any other book in the New Testament. And if that event didn't take place, then we have a, a, a problem uh, in Scripture. So this is part of the issues that we face, at least in modernism. What are some of the challenges that have been raised about the Bible's history? So the modernist agenda really was quite devastating to the Bible. It began by questioning um, the early portions of scripture, particularly the, the five books of Moses, the, the Torah or the Pentateuch, as we call it. Um, it came up with suggesting different sources for those books. It relegated those books to something less than history. And in the article, we point out that there are really two ideas in German theological thinking about history. One is history, which is the facts as they actually occurred. And the other is Geschichte. We don't have those uh, nuances in English in the same way, but Geschichte is how we uh, interpret what happened and how we uh, make sense out of, of that. And so it really is not actually fact-based, but more history as we understand it, which can fluctuate and change, of course. And many uh, Lutheran theologians, we think of one in particular, Gerhard von Rath, tried to, to overcome the lack of history that modernism had, had relegated the Bible to with those presuppositions and tried to come up with a, a, a way to save the Bible. <laughs> and, and he came up with this idea of salvation history, which is not based necessarily on the facts, but based on the theology of what the Bible uh, gives and what the Bible provides. And by separating the facts from, from the theology, what we had then is, is something that I feel is, is, is inferior, <laughs> because if, if the events did not occur as they are said to have occurred in Scripture, then what kind of God then are we talking about? Um, what kind of God actually exists? Does he even exist? Um, and so if the Exodus event didn't happen, if the creation event didn't happen, if all of these, and, and systematically historical criticism questioned more and more of the historicity of the Bible, uh, the Germans and, and the Europeans were very, very early on 
uh, working in this mode of thinking. It, it impacted the Protestant and Catholic churches in a major way because both were working under the same presuppositions, and we still see this today very much. So what we have is, is a Bible that is devoid, really, of its history for the most part, but we still cling to its theology. But without the history, we can pretty much make the theology what we want to make it in many ways. So it's very difficult. So let me use a couple of examples. And we see this progressing even in the postmodern age, even further to a point of almost nihilism where there is a belief in nothing. Um, we have, for instance, the beginning was Genesis 1 through 11. Then later on, it was, um, well, there was a counter, uh, counter movement against this in America by a number of very key historians and archaeologists, actually, and some theologians as well, to try to counteract what was happening in Europe. And they tried to base the Bible more in the realm of history again. Uh, but that was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And by the 70s, that kind of uh, disappeared as well. In the 1970s, we had a really major frontal attack, if we will, on the patriarchal period, the last part of the book of Genesis. Um, then in the 1980s, we had a, a frontal attack on the Exodus account. Uh, I'm talking about Americans and Europeans, and this kind of became the norm in critical scholarship. In the 1990s, it moved to the monarchy, the United Monarchy of David and Solomon. There were some extreme hypercritical scholars in Europe who ba basically said that David uh, really was a mythical figure, Solomon was a mythical figure, because we hadn't found their names outside of the Bible. Again, uh, this assumption of methodological doubt that we referred to earlier, and because those names hadn't been found, we really couldn't believe that, that they existed. These were mythical uh, events, myth mythical history. So, over the course of time, almost all of the Bible began to be viewed as non-historical. I'm talking now about the Old Testament. And we come to the point in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s where some scholars were going so far as to say, I'm quoting one verbatim right now, if historical verifiable truth is our only concern, the Bible referring to the Old Testament, would only be written on about 10 pages or so, and it would be utterly boring. So you can see the reductionist trend that has removed history more and more and has made it virtually a non-historical book. And that's what postmodernism does, in a sense, when truth is no longer really, and history can be rewritten and revised, it's, it's no longer as essential as it once was. As an archaeologist, do you have an example of how the Bible's history has been confirmed? The Bible's history is, is amazing, and one of the reasons why we can go back as archaeologists and historians and look at biblical history is because the Bible claims to be, con it, it is constituted in history. The Bible mentions places, it mentions cities, it mentions rivers, it mentions locations, because that is physically where God's people were and where God interacted in that history. Just by comparison, if you were to look at the Quran, you have already, if you take the entire Quran and the places mentioned in the Quran, um, they're, they're completely taken already by the time you come to Genesis 10 in the Bible. So Genesis 10, by the time you get through the first 10 ch chapters of Genesis, you have as many place names mentioned as you have in the entire Quran. That just gives you an idea of how the Bible really is very interested in the physical aspects of, of life. And of course, there's poetry and there's all kinds of other genres of literature in scripture, but it is a historical document first and foremost. And so that's what allows us to have a discipline like biblical archaeology. You won't find a discipline like Hindu archaeology or Buddhist archaeology because those are esoteric religions that are based on philosophical ideas, not so much grounded in the history of the event where God intervenes in history. So as archaeologists, we can go to these ancient countries 
uh, these places, these, these cities, and we can excavate them. And by excavating them, we are connecting back to the history of that period and that time. And I've been working in this field now for over 30 years, uh, excavating many sites in Israel and Jordan and Cyprus. And what we find in the archaeological record is that these were real places and that these were places that as the Bible mentions, existed during that time. And we can also see that the events that the Bible describes are, are taking place there. Now, what critical scholars often will do, however, based on that last principle, the principle of uh, criticism, they will uh, say this, they will say, well, we haven't found the archaeological evidence yet, therefore it didn't happen, um, it, or the event didn't happen. Um, sometimes they won't even put the yet there. They'll just say, we didn't find the archaeological evidence, therefore it didn't take place. This argument is an argument from silence. In science, it's not a good argument to make because scientists and archaeologists, we were scientists as well, we're working in the field every single summer, um, and we are uncovering uh, that evidence uh, year by year, and you never know what new discoveries will be made and what new things will happen. And so, uh, the argument from silence is really not a good one. Uh, there's a great saying that is it really works well in English, and it goes something like this. The absence of evidence should never be construed as evidence for absence. And that is simply to say that simply because we don't have the evidence yet, it doesn't mean that we won't have it sometime in the future. I have an artifact, a replica here of an artifact that was discovered in uh, it's a stone, to, uh, three, three stones actually uh, uh, together. It's part of a very large inscription that was placed uh, at the northern site of Tel Dan in Israel. And if you uh, look at the bottom of this uh, inscription here on this line, it actually says uh, something very interesting. It is an inscription that mentions a campaign by an Aramean king against the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And on this line, it says that he defeated the king of Israel, and he defeated the king of the house of David. So a scholar in 1992 had argued that David had not been found in the archaeological record, and so we shouldn't take his kingdom very seriously. It was mythical. The next year in 1993, this inscription was found. And that just goes to show that one needs to be very, very careful when making these kinds of arguments. We can mention hundreds of examples like this of cities, of pe people, um, you know, places and people, even events that we now uh, are able to understand based on archaeology. In Daniel, for example, there was always the question in Daniel uh, chapter five, uh, what on earth was going on? Why is Belshazzar mentioned as the last king of Babylon? Historically, we know that Nebuchadnezzar was the last king of Babylon. Belshazzar, for hundreds of years, as critical scholars were working back in the 16, 17, and 1800s, didn't know anything about a Belshazzar. So what on earth, who was Belshazzar, and why is Daniel interacting with him? And uh, today we know through archaeological records and evidence uh, from Nabonidus himself that he left Babylon for 10 years uh, to go to another city, and he entrusted the kingship to his firstborn son. In other documents, he clarifies that this firstborn son is none other than Belshazzar, and this would explain why in that passage in Daniel, Daniel's given the third position in the kingdom, not the second position. He's given the third position because Nabonidus was the king, Belshazzar was reigning in his place, and Daniel was the third uh, person to receive that honor after he interpreted the handwriting on the wall. So these little bits of detail um, are, are coming to light over and over again. In 2007, Viennese, a scholar from the University of Vienna, was working in the British Museum uh, down in the basements, uh, uncovering uh, and reading through thousands of tablets, uh, these cuneiform tablets written in Neo-Babylonian. And he came across a name mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 3, 
a name just mentioned in passing with the list of officials that were there during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, a certain um, individual who was known as Nebuchadnezzar. And he sees this name on this tablet dated to year 10 of Nebuchadnezzar, and he became very, very excited because for the first time we had that name outside of the Bible. Uh, in 2018, an announcement was made of a small, tiny seal impression, no larger than your fingernail, that was discovered in uh, Jerusalem that bore the name Isaiah the prophet or Isaiah prophet. For the first time, we have the seal impression, the excavator believes, of none other than the prophet Isaiah, who wrote the largest prophetic book in the Old Testament. So these things, we can go on and on about these discoveries that have been made in archaeology, but they testify that we do have a book that is accurate, that we do have a book that portrays the history that is there. And while we may not have everything that we find in the Bible present in the archaeological record, we have more than probably any other ancient book that exists in the world today. And we certainly have good evidence to go by. What is the connection between history and theology? History and theology must be linked together because if the God, if the God of the Bible works in history, he needs to be understood as a historical being, a being that that has limited himself in some way to history. He created history at the beginning. He created time at the beginning. He's a timeless individual, uh, but he created time in the built beginning and the Godhead has been working through that time through history. The ultimate act in God's intervention in history was the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. As we have said, these presuppositions would even negate that event in history where many theologians today would argue that Jesus was simply a good man. He was simply a moral leader. Um, his death on the cross um, is important, but, you know, if you remove all the other elements of history, it's not, it, it, it ceases to be uh, the importance that it, it is for, for most Christians in the world today. Uh, so history really matters. It's very, very important. And let me, let me give you a, a couple of, of examples. If the Exodus did not take place, why is it that throughout Scripture, over and over and over again, do we have the phrase being used by God, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt? Over and over again, we're talking about dozens of times this phrase occurs in Scripture. How would we make sense out of that if the event didn't take place? Paul also makes this extremely important point of the connection between history and theology. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are oft even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. So Paul here is arguing very, very concisely, but very pointedly to the fact that if the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ did not take place, and this is a miraculous event, right? If that didn't take place, then the whole Christian faith is basically in vain. Our preaching is worthless and we might as well still be in our sins because we have no hope. So in this sense, Paul is arguing that history, what happened historically when Jesus died on the cross, when he rested on the Sabbath and when he rose again, is absolutely fundamental to our faith. Thank you, Dr. Michael Hazel, for broadening our understanding about the importance of history in interpreting the biblical text. And thank you also for joining us. Till next time. For a deeper understanding of this topic, go to AdventistBiblicalResearch.org slash store and buy the book Biblical Hermeneutics and Adventist Approach. For additional resources, visit AdventistBiblicalResearch.org.